If your group experiences have been anything like mine, then you have almost certainly seen some uh, group discussions that ended up much like this. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can get along in small groups and we can find and manage conflict effectively. We can find ways to navigate group conflict and uh, and just uh, have it work out better than it did um, for Dale and Brennan in that situation, right? So in this video, that's what we're going to look at. How do we navigate group conflict and how can we best manage those types of situations? So uh, before we talk about managing it, let's talk about what conflict is. Let's define conflict. Conflict is an expressed struggle between interdependent parties involving the perception of incompatible goals, scarce resources, and, and or interference. Right. So a couple of things that are highlighted there, as you can see, first of all, conflict is an expressed struggle, meaning it's known between, you know, by both people, not just one person having an issue. Uh, and that's not conflict. Conflict is when both people are aware of the of the issue and and it's been expressed. It's it's known between the two. It's between interdependent parties, meaning they have some sort of connection, some some something, some way that, you know, one party affects the other. What one party does affects the other. And that's what we mean by interdependent. So in a group, you're going to be inter interdependent for sure. And it can involve the incompatible goals, scarce resources or interference, or it could just involve the perception of those things. It doesn't even have to be real. Those things don't even have to be real. But if one or both people believe that there are incompatible goals, scarce resources, or interference, and or interference, then conflict can be the result of that as well. So um, it doesn't even have, they, they can be in, in existence, um, but they don't have to be, right? So um, they can just be the perception of those things. Uh, you know, like so many other things in life too, there are positives and negatives here. We've got to balance these things out and uh, and take things as they come. There, there are positives and negatives uh, that come from conflict. We see the relationship between conflict and intensity, or conflict, intensity, and outcomes. We we really want some conflict. You want that tension in terms of bringing out the best ideas, and you want a discussion and uh, and debate and conflict in that way. But you want it to be appropriate conflict. Obviously, you want it to be appropriate in the sense that it's about the right things, that it's about um, uh, task oriented things and not. Um, personal items necessarily, uh, hopefully, but uh, but you want it to be appropriate in that regard. You want it to be um, an appropriate amount, and you want it to be the appropriate intensity. You don't want things to be too calm or to be passive aggressive and too high intensity, and you'll have uh, you know fist fights and rolling around on the ground. You don't want that either. So, if you have appropriate conflict in the right amount of intensity, the moderate intensity, then it can have a positive impact on your group's final outcome. It can it can be a positive in the life of your group. So we want to keep that in mind. The conflict is not all bad. We want to balance those positives and negatives with conflict and uh, and make sure we're trying to achieve, you know, appropriate conflict in the appropriate intensity. Uh, so there are a couple of different types of conflict. Just real quickly, we want to talk about what are the different types of conflict. First, you can have conflict over substance. Right, conflict over the actual details of a task or, or details of, of uh, a debate, and so conflict over substance. You can have conflict over value, and values. Right, so uh, the worth of something, and uh, and you know whether it meets the values of the group. So you can you can have conflict over those types of things. You can have conflict over the process. In other words, how you do things, how things are being done. What's the best way for us to accomplish these things? You can have, you know, debate, healthy debate and conflict over those things. And you can have conflict over misperceived differences. So like you said, conflict can involve just the perception of those things as well. Um, so sometimes it doesn't even involve the actual things. But if it if people believe it's true, then they can have conflict over it, true conflict over it. So we can have it over those misperceived differences um, where actually we may be we may have commonalities, but we're seeing them as differences in some way. So let's jump into some conflict management strategies. Okay, We know what conflict is. We know kind of where it can come from. Um, but what are some things we can do to manage conflict? What are some different conflict management strategies that we can use? Well, one strategy that we have is avoiding. We can avoid a problem. And, uh, and you know, not always the greatest idea. I mean, unless there's some harm, you know, potential harm to someone, like physical harm to someone or potentially... Uh, you know, I don't know what you could avoid it, uh, but it's not going to make the problem go away. That conflict's not going to go away necessarily. It's just going to fester usually. So 
Uh, avoiding is probably the, it's what we call a lose-lose strategy. You end up losing, uh, both sides lose, and you lose all the way around. You lose in the relationship, you lose in the work relationship, you lose in the social dimension and the task dimension, and, and so you, you don't really want that. Um, avoiding is not probably the ideal um, uh, strategy to pursue in, in, any of the, in most things. Another strategy that we have is accommodating. Right? We can accommodate. We can give it. We call this lose-win. Right? We give in to the other person, basically. We lose and we let them win. Um, so we, we lose and we let them win. And that can be good at times. You know, there are times, well, first of all, if we, if we see the, the wisdom of their ways or the wisdom of their argument and we are won over, that's, that's fine. We can accommodate in that way. Um, if it's something that's just not that important to us and clearly it is to the other person, we can accommodate and give them that. Um, or we can accommodate, accommodate just to be the bigger person. Um, if, it, you know, if we think it's not going to negatively impact the group overall, we can just, you know, be the bigger person and say, okay, I might, that's fine. You can have this one. And we accommodate in that way. Those can all be positive things and they can help build relationships within the group and they can help the group, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, grease the, the gears a little bit and, and help things run a little more smoothly so we can keep moving in the group. However, if we're accommodating because we feel pressured to do so, because we feel powerless in a sense, or we feel like we have to give in to the other person for whatever reason, um, then that can be a problem in the long run because then we're going to, again, that's something that's going to fester within us, could result in some passive aggressive behavior. And just, um, so we want to make sure we're not accommodating just to, um, just to appease somebody or just because we don't feel like we have the power to step up and, and, uh, and make our case or, you know, push, press our argument. Now there are times, you know, as we're talking about, we compete, we lose. That's one thing. That's, I mean, that's the group decides to do it the other way. Okay, we've, we've given it our best shot, but accommodating and just giving in can be healthy, but it can also be unhealthy depending on the mindset behind it and the attitude that the person has who's doing the accommodating. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we can engage in competing. We can go for it. We can make our argument. We can try and uh, persuade the other people and we can try and, um, you know, win out, have our side win out. And, uh, and, and we call that um, win-lose, where we win and the other person loses, but sometimes it can uh, devolve into lose-lose as well. Sometimes it can get into a situation where um, even though we win, it damages that relationship so badly that, that it impedes the group function and, and that's not great, or it, uh, you know, it just causes the other person to become so disruptive that that's an issue. So, I mean, just be aware that that's a potential issue with competing that we may win, but in the long term, it may cause more problems as well. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go for it. If you believe strongly in your idea and uh, then then go for it and compete. Um, but also you want to be sure that that you're not just falling into the trap of those perceived uh, scarce resources or incompatible goals that you actually have those right. If you're going to compete, you ought to confirm that you're actually at odds with another person that you actually have goals that are incompatible, that you actually have scarce resources and aren't just uh, perceiving that incorrectly, you're not misperceiving that. So uh, you want to be sure that if you're going to compete, that you got all your facts straight and then you give it your best. You, you compete fairly. Um, you don't fight dirty. And then, you know, whoever wins, wins. You, maybe you win, maybe the other person does, but, uh, but you've given it your effort, you've given it your best shot. And, and uh, so you can engage in competing. We can also engage in compromise, which you know, has developed a really good reputation. People like the sound of compromise. Hey, let's compromise. Let's do that. Well, you know, we came to a compromise and that's fine. That's wonderful. But by definition, compromise involves both people giving up some of what they want because compromise means both people get some of what they want, but they also lose some of what they want. They don't get some of what they want. That can be good for short-term resolutions and for small, smaller things. That's fine uh, that people don't really care that much about. But when it's a larger issue, again, this can breed that kind of passive aggressive um, festering when somebody gets, you know, part of what they want and they're, they're fine at first. And then later on, they start thinking, wait, I, well, I don't understand why I had to give that up. I really wanted the rest of that too. And I didn't get it. And, and now I'm really kind of upset about that. And, you know, that can breed some, some contempt and some, some passive aggressive behavior. So we want to be cautious of, of that with compromise, but you know, in general, compromise is fine. If that's what it takes to get things done, you know, you give up a little bit, the other person gives up a little bit, you get the majority of what you want and uh, you find a way to come together. And, and again, you grease those wheels, you keep them moving forward. You keep them, you keep, keep the machine moving a little bit. Right. And that's important in a group as well. The ideal conflict management strategy 
though in groups or any other you know, conflict management situation, is going to be collaborating. Collaborating means that, uh, by definition, both people get all of what they want. Everybody involved gets all, all of what they want. Uh, now, that sounds pretty simple, right? Everybody just gets all of what they want. We know it's not always that simple, um, and it's not even necessarily possible all the time. But when it is possible, it's your best option for uh, long-term satisfaction of all the people involved. So if it's a major issue, if it's something that's that's really important to you or to the others and or to the group's success, and um, if, if it makes that much difference, if it's that important, then it's worth the time for collaborating and effort that it takes to collaborate. Uh, you know, if it's something minor, it may not be worth it. It may not be worth the time and the energy, but if it's something that's significant, then then it probably is worth it for collaborating. But uh, that means, you know, again, everybody gets all of what they want. And that can take some time and some effort and some energy and, and some work on, on the part of everybody involved. So um, we can see, you know, from this, this uh, chart that we have here that um, when we look at it in terms of concern for self and concern for others, um, collaborating is obviously the top corner. Both those, it shows both great concern for you, yourself, and great concern for the others involved. Um, avoiding it shows the least amount of concern for each. And the others uh, fall along those spectrums. You can see where they where they fall there. But uh, so when we think about it in that context, um, collaborating is, is no question the, the best option um, for long term satisfaction for everybody involved. Now, let's talk about something that's kind of important. Let's talk about what we can do to prevent conflict outright. I mean, like, we, you know, before it even happens. So there are a few tips that we have for preventing conflict um, from, from happening in the first place. First, you can emphasize your group goals and effectiveness. Stress the importance of that. If you've got buy-in from your team members, um, that can be very effective in helping to prevent conflict and help uh, you know, minimize those conflict situations from the start. Uh, you can provide a stable, a well-structured task structure for everybody. So provide, you know, give everybody a job to do, give them a way to do it and, uh, and, and instructions on how to go about it. And then everybody will just kind of be doing their own thing. You won't see as many conflicts in the group. You can facilitate dialogue. So encourage people to talk, encourage people to talk about when they have an idea and what they think that the group ought to be doing, what's important, uh, facilitate dialogue to get ideas out in the open to begin with so people feel like they're heard and people feel like they're not just being walked over and, and you're encouraging dialogue from everyone and, and in all from all the angles. Right? Avoid win-lose situations whenever possible. Win-lose situations lead to conflict. You know, when somebody's losing, it's not, not great. So you want to avoid those competitive situations if possible um, and just, just uh, uh, avoid somebody having to end up a loser because uh, then that does breed conflict in a lot of ways. So if we were to look at uh, conflicts, uh, conflict reduction, not prevention, but strategies for conflict reduction, and we have uh, some things that we can look at here, and they're really going to be on the spectrum between uh, from uh, changing behaviors on one end to changing attitudes on the other. And so they fall kind of on the spectrum in the way that they're lined up here. But starting with changing behaviors, and then we'll move down to changing attitudes. Um, uh, first, you know, changing behavior is physical separation. If you're, if you're having conflict, you're having issues with conflict, to reduce the amount of conflict you can Get some physical separation. Your group doesn't have to do all of their work in the same space at the same time all of the time. So you can get some physical separation, at least between the people who are experiencing the conflict. You can establish rules and regulation. What, what are the expectations for behavior and how do we regulate that? How are we, um, how are we disciplining people who violate those? And, and you know, what are the consequences for doing that? Uh, you can limit intergroup interaction. Right, so limit um, contact or, or you know interaction with uh, with other groups. Um, if that if that's going to be an issue, sometimes that can breed conflict as well. You can use uh, integrators. Uh, you can you can incorporate the use of integrators, people who are kind of skilled at and uh, and and assigned to working other people into the group and reducing conflict by helping them feel included and uh, and by uh, specifically having that role of helping to reduce conflict and manage conflict. Uh, you can engage in confrontation and negotiation. Right? You can just step up in the middle of it and say, okay, this is obviously going on. This is an issue. Here's how we're going to do this. What are we going to do to to find some resolution here? So you can engage in very explicit confrontation of that conflict and negotiation of um, resolution. You can bring in a third party. 
to, to talk it out or to, to, you know, act as an arbiter and decide what the behavior should be, what the change should be. Uh, but you can, you can consult a, a third party, uh, whether that's your supervisor or whether it's just a, an objective third party. You can rotate members out. If you got somebody who's, who's having an issue or being, becoming an issue, you can rotate them out and, uh, and bring somebody else in uh, to the team if you have uh, the opportunity to do so. You can identify interdependent tasks and, and subordinate goals, meaning ways that you're connected, things, you know, tasks, tasks that you're doing that, uh, that you have to work on together, that you need the whole team to be in on and superordinate goals that, that oversee or, you know, that, that supersede the individual goals of different group members. And you can train people. You can just use training to, to prepare people to work in groups and to work with others and to do a variety of different things. So you can use training to help, uh, help, help change attitudes and, and uh, prepare people for those situations. You know, while this isn't always going to work and not every group is going to end up, you know, like Dale and Brennan being best friends forever, um, they can be effective. You can find ways to prevent conflict and to confront conflict and to manage it um, within the group when it does come up. So um, I would encourage you to, to consider those and, and think of different strategies that you might use in your own groups. If you have questions about how to, who, to uh, uh, navigate conflict in small groups, please send me, me an email. I'd ha be happy to chat with you about that a little further. In the meantime, I hope this has provided some insight for you as you engage in your groups and come up against these difficult situations and, and, and you know, see some of the different ways and strategies that you have for navigating and managing conflict in small groups.